of our uh, three live webinars as part of this month's Standards Matter series. I'm Melinda Bruce. I'm a registered early childhood educator here at the College of Early Childhood Educators in the Professional Practice Department. And before I introduce our guest speaker, Jan Blacksall, I just want to note a few housekeeping uh, items. You will have noticed uh, perhaps by now that there is the chat box located in your bottom right corner. Uh, you can put any question that you have uh, regarding tonight's presentation there, as well as any technical difficulties you may be having. Our moderator, Amanda, will uh, receive them there. Okay? So February marked the launch of this bi-monthly series that focuses on each of the six standards. Now, it's really important to note that with our new Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice that came out this past July 2017, it's really important to continually revisit your code and standards uh, and to really ensure that you understand and that you're applying your ethical and professional standards uh, in your daily practice. Um, we are kicking off this series with Standard 1, Caring and Responsive Relationships, and there is a dedicated Standards Matter page on the college website. It features new resources, videos, webinars like this one, and lots more. Um, they're really there to, to inspire thinking and reinforce some of the key practice elements, um, some of which you'll see here as leadership, relationships, the learning environment, pedagogical approaches, and uh, most certainly communication and collaboration. So before we get started, I just wanted to take an audience poll. As you'll see here, the poll notes, do you think that caring and responsive relationships with children and families help you to anticipate and prevent challenges? So just take a few moments and uh, complete that poll. Great. It looks like lots of you feel that you strongly agree or that you agree, so that's, that's really great to hear and to see. Um, I want to quickly just revisit Standard 1. The principle of Standard 1 says that RECEs understand that strong and positive relationships contribute to healthy child development and are necessary for children's well-being and learning. It also says that building and maintaining caring and responsive relationships with children, families, and colleagues is fundamental to the practice of the profession, to the practice of our ECD. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's uh, featured speaker, Jan Blacksall, a registered early childhood educator. Jan taught early childhood education courses at both Fanshawe College and Conestoga College for 30 years. She was a member of the Best Start Expert Panel on Early Learning. She has also co-authored the text, Children at the Center, Principles of Early Childhood Education in Canada, and contributes to articles in the Canadian Child Care Federation's Journal Interaction, as well as an editor and contributor to the Ideas Journal of Emotional Wellbeing. Jan is also a trainer for Kids Have Stress 2 and Second Step Program. Currently, she provides consultations and professional learning sessions to RECEs and child care center staff, as well as offers online learning modules and webinars to the Early Years Professional Development Center, Dominion Learning Institute of Canada, where she's the Director of Program Development. So this is over to you, Jan. Thank you very much. I can hear you. Yes? Great. Okay. Well, I would like to um, just say how, how honored and privileged I feel to be here um, chatting with you tonight and how much I want to thank the College of VCE for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. And uh, I will say that through my um, time of working with children and observing children as a, excuse me, as a, a, a faculty member visiting into child care centers, um, I firmly, firmly believe that we can't say enough about the importance of relationships. So this, uh, this webinar really appealed to me. 
Okay, so the overview um, of the standard that we're talking about is anticipation and prevention. And I want to talk to you about those things and then remind you that um, in many cases you're like a first responder to a 911 call from a child. You need to have a plan and when the situation is really um, a difficult situation, you need to do some relationship CPR. So hopefully by the end of the evening you'll have some ideas and strategies that you can take with you. Um, I feel pretty strongly that um, you can't really do anything well if you just get the strategies without really understanding the reasons for it. So we will spend a little bit of time on some theory as well. Okay, so there's the standard we were talking about. Um, the importance of strong positive relationships for healthy child development, well-being and learning. And that this is fundamental to what we do as early childhood educators. Those relationships are crucial. Okay. And um, from the practice guideline, which I was absolutely thrilled to see, um, it's just full of amazing information. And I think it's really important that we understand that it is a time of reframing of the definition of behavior guidance. Um, we uh, have a long history of being part of talking about things like behavior management and classroom management. Sorry, I've got an itchy nose. And um, I think it's we really in the 21st century have come to a much more um, in-depth understanding of the role that we have um, in not um, managing children's behavior, but guiding their development to the point where they can self-regulate and engage in positive interactions. Okay. And my personal um, uh, belief system around guidance is that this is a partnership of the uh, child and the early childhood educator, the RECE, um, are together on this journey. Um, and as such, um, each person contributes something to, uh, to this journey of guidance. Um, both the child and the uh, RECE have their own perspectives. They have their own emotional reactions. And they both act according to their own um, understanding of their own needs in a situation. Uh, and you'll recognize this, I'm sure, think, feel, act is uh, a very important part of the um, Ministry of Education's approach to um, the framework for um, child care. And it's um, also a, a popular um, combination of thinking in, in uh, self-regulation work, in cognitive behavior therapy. And it's really about um, trying to understand the connection between our thoughts, our feelings, and our action. So, um, again, coming from the practice guideline, what we think when we respond to children's behavior is um, influenced by many, many factors. Some of these are um, the experiences in education that you've had. I'm going to say how long ago you had it, where you had it, um, whether you've been updating your professional growth um, since you were in school, um, policies that you have in your uh, child care workplace, your program statement, um, things that the family brings to you, requests that the family brings to you about their own um, style of, of guidance and their own understanding of their child needs. Uh, the workplace, the conditions in your workplace, whether it's a calm and um, soothing workplace or whether it's uh, fast-paced and uh, a little bit chaotic can really um, influence us as well because um, it can influence our own self-regulation and stress management. Um, responding to children's behavior is a very, very highly personal and cultural um, dimension as well. Many of us respond to children the way our parents 
responded to us and raised us. And because we turned out fine, we are perfectly comfortable doing um, what our parents did. And we sometimes have to reflect on that a little bit and make sure that we're, um, we're practicing within um, current understanding of children's needs. And we also need to be very um, uh, sensitive to um, a variety of cultural beliefs. Uh, not all cultures have the same goals for children, and we really need to, uh, to know our families well. And uh, we can't ignore our own personal coping strategies. What do we do when we get stressed and dysregulated? How do we handle situations that are challenging? And at any one time with any one child, um, any of these factors can uh, be the, um, the driving force in how you respond to a particular behavior. Okay. So the topic um, is about anticipating challenges. And I'm going to say to you that um, there will be challenges. Um, Anticipation can be apprehension. Uh, you can come into your program in the morning um, worrying about the difficult children you have, the ones who might disrupt the plans that you have, um, the misbehaviors that you might have to deal with, your anxiety about a, a particularly challenging behavior that some children may be ex exhibiting. And if those are your thoughts, then your feelings will reflect those thoughts. Stress, um, maybe frustration that you have to always think about that one child um, before you can uh, um, carry out your, your planning. Sometimes even anger. Some kids push our buttons. Some kids make us um, more angry than their behavior would necessarily uh, warrant. And if we're in a state an emotional state of stress or frustration or anger, there's a very good chance that we are going to react to a child um, off the top of uh, our heads or, or without really a, a planned intervention. And sometimes we can overreact if we're not really carefully thinking about what we want to be doing. Okay, so what we want to do is to take that apprehension out of the anticipation. And that's where reframing becomes important. Rethinking um, our views and of children, our beliefs. Um, I can remember very early on in my career as an early childhood educator, I, I uh, read a statement by um, a psychologist named Daniel Gartrell. He said, there is no such thing as a bad child. And that has stayed with me always. There is no such thing as a bad child. And there's no such thing as a behavior kid. I have such a hard time when I hear people talking about a group of children that they call the behavior kids. Um, they're children, and their behavior is part of them. It's part of their way of communicating. It's part of their way of dealing with stress. Um, another thing that Stuart Shanker would have us really think about is that when we're thinking about children's behavior, we shouldn't be thinking about compliance and control, about them being obedient, but instead about them being self-regulated and able to make good choices. Um, another thing that um, has helped me a lot is uh, coming to understand that negative consequences won't change behavior. Negative consequences that we impose typically increase the child's stress level. And when we increase the child's stress level, we increase the um, challenging behavior that we're trying to reduce. Um, another thing that uh, is very important for us to remember is that the child has a problem when they're misbehaving or behaving in a way that we see as misbehaving. They have a need, and they don't know how to address their need or solve their problem. And so their behavior becomes that communication, that message to you, 
I don't know what to do here. And we really need, in, as part of our planned intervention, is to really observe for a minute, take a deep breath and say, what does the child need in this moment? And I think it's really, really important to stay focused in the moment and not be worried about looking too far into the future, about is this never going to stop? It's, it's not going to stop in that moment, but you can address what the child is, is needing and start to build some of the foundations um, for the self-regulated behavior we want to see. Okay, so when you change your thoughts to be more, more child-focused um, and more understanding and you recognize that the child isn't out to get you, it isn't deliberately behaving, then you can start to feel some compassion for what the child is going through. And you can stay calm because you can say, this isn't about me, even though we're in this together. The child is sending me a message, and the message isn't one of defiance or of dislike. It's one of, um, of stress and hurting. And when we're compassionate and calm, then our actions can become more um, helpful to the situation. Um, when we approach a child with, uh, with no anger or frustration on our face, with a very genuine uh, expression of caring, they're more open to connect with us, they're easier to comfort, they can begin to co-regulate, and you know, down the road you can start to coach them. Okay, what might you do in this situation? What's a good strategy? And I, I just find it interesting that all of those words start with C. So when you're trying to think um, of how you might um, address uh, a challenging situation, keep the letter C in your mind, and maybe that'll help to be a little, uh, a little trigger of remind, remembering to stay compassionate and calm and work on connecting and comforting. OK, so that's us as an RECE, really trying to look at um, our, our own thoughts, our own feelings about the child. And then we take it from the child's point of view. And the child may also be approaching um, situations with apprehension. Um, this little girl is looking pretty happy. Um, but sometimes you can see a child who comes in and they start their day in a state of, um, of uh, distress or unhappiness. And again, we look at the think, feel, act um, pattern. What we might see is the child feeling like, I'm alone. I don't like what's happening here. I don't want to be here or do this. Um, I remember my cousin's little guy went to kindergarten his first day he came home and he said, Mom, don't sign me up for any more of those lessons because I'm not going back. And I think it's just so important to realize how many children also approach their days with apprehension. Um, and they feel the strong emotions of stress, sadness, anxiety, and sometimes anger that they have to be there, that they don't want to be there. And again, when we get that pattern of thinking and feeling, we're going to get the action that is a reaction and sometimes an overreaction to the situation because the child isn't in a state of calm. And then we talk to talk about the role that stress plays. And uh, this is a huge part of anticipation. Knowing your children. Um, stress is part of life. Uh, stress comes from bumps in the road. Maybe the child is moving. Um, just to give you another quick example, my uh, another uh, child in my uh, life circle started a new kindergarten, no, new grade one, new school, and they had moved as well to a new house. And she was very stressed, but she was managing pretty well until one day she came home and she said, I can't go back to school next week, Mom. And the mother said, um, why? And she said, because I can't do the Terry Fox run. And the, 
the crisis for her was something was being expected of her that she didn't understand. She was in a new neighborhood, in a new school. She didn't have all of those connections that were part of her sense of security. And that one thing that was um, unexpected, unanticipated, was the one thing that was creating a bump in the road for her. Um, family issues, things going on at home, peer issues, being excluded, um, being told you can't play, you can't come to my birthday, um, being uh, um, part of, a, of a, a, an aggression um, community where children uh, fight out their differences rather than problem solve in more appropriate ways. All of those things can create levels of stress that can be problematic for children. And I've called those levels of stress tolerable for a reason um, that I'll come back to. Um, so because of those bumps in the road, we really need to access as much available information as we have about the family situation. And a big part of our relationships are collaborating with families, having those conversations. Um, there are, are um, specific uh, questions that the ministry requires that pa parents share with child care centers when they enroll their child. I think there should be another set of questions um, that just um, gather information about a little bit about the child's life, about any um, things that might be challenging for the child, um, things that um, that you might need to keep in mind when you're dealing with uh, a child who's not as, as uh, calm and uh, alert as we might hope. So children at risk, um, there are, are such a wide variety of adversity and sometimes it's mild and I think one of the biggest things is a disconnect between what the child needs and how the adults understand them. Um, tell you a lovely story about a little boy who he and his mother had moved three times because they had left um, uh, a pretty negative um, uh, father relationship and then they had rejoined the mother's um, uh, birth family and the relationship with her father was also negative and then they had had to relocate again and then again. And so the little boy was uh, really struggling, and his behavior was uh, was showing off his stress to his mother. And I just had a conversation with him, and I said, "Sounds like things are going pretty pretty rough for you." And uh, he says, "Yeah." I says, "What's going on?" And he says, "Oh, I'm just so worried about my mom." I said, "What What are you worried about?" So she's just so upset, and I said, oh, and, and is there something that you would like to happen? And he says, I, I just wish she would stop yelling at me and, and, and hitting me. Maybe if she could just remember to kind of stop and take a big breath um, when she was chasing me, maybe it would be better. So again, we see this little guy whose needs are totally um, um, misread by the mother, who sees him as a as a behavior challenge when in reality he's just uh, picking up on the stress that she's going through. And then um, even though Canada is one of the best places in the world to live, we have many, many children who are um, exposed to um, severe forms of, of adversity, um, severe poverty, poverty that can lead to neglect, um, domestic violence, child abuse, um, any newcomer children that might have been exposed to war or, uh, or uh, total deprivation. And the reality is those kids are coming into our programs. They may not have a sign on them saying, I've had a rough go, but sometimes um, their behavior will be the way that they'll let you know that they're, they're uh, their life has been tough. We, so we need to anticipate, and again, going back to that anticipating, 
Some children are going to come to us with deep hurt and pain, with not a lot of trust that adults can be counted on to meet their needs. Sometimes with some pretty raw emotions, they might be pretty upset that people aren't um, understanding where they're coming from. And some children come to us with just really basic unmet needs for safety and connection. And um, we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about that still. So we had the, the slide earlier about the children in tolerable stress. And now we've got a child I'm going to say is in toxic stress, who's also coming into our, our program with apprehension, thinking some of the same thoughts. I'm alone. It's not safe here. I can't trust. I have to look out for myself and feeling the dis uh, more extreme issues of distress, depression, fear, anger, and many of their behaviors are overreactions. And the difference between a child in tolerable stress and toxic stress is whether there's an adult in their life, a person. And uh, so I think we have to, to, uh, to be aware of that as well. Okay, so we have our children in our relationship and here's another child who's in a very um, stressed situation but because they have a trusted relationship the difference is um, we've got children who don't feel alone, who understand that there is someone they can trust and that they're not on their own to look out for their own needs. Okay. So prevention, we've talked a lot about anticipation and if we're going to anticipate these challenges coming through the door then we need to plan um, a ways to prevent some of those challenging behaviors from um, realize, being realized. Your relationship with the child is the most important tool you have. Kaiser and Razminsky have been um, teaching about and writing about meeting uh, challenging behavior um, issues for many, many, many years. And uh, I can't disagree with them at all. I, the relationship is the most important tool. And Dr. Jean Clinton, who I think you've probably saw her video uh, a little bit earlier on, is, is just reminding us the more connection that we have with children, the less need there is for correcting, for directing, and managing their behavior. So the bottom line, there's no supportive relationship. Children have less self-regulation. They can't trust you enough to co-regulate with you. Challenging behaviors continue. Learning is hindered. And social interactions are problematic. Okay, so the goal is for you to be the person. Um, when you're the person for the child, um, your um, intervention, your involvement um, can be a form of prevention. So you need to recognize, anticipate, and meet the needs that you're recognizing through the child's behavior. When are they falling apart? What are they falling apart about? And it might be those universal needs that we talked about for um, safety, protection, security, um, feeling a sense of belonging and well-being, or it might be individual needs, things that are going on at home or in the, in the peer group um, that you need. It might be temperament. It might be um, learning cha challenges. Sorry. Um, you have to get to know the child as an individual. Okay, so we have uh, some time left to really talk about the strategies. Um, four main strategies, and these are the core of early childhood education. I'm not going to be telling you anything that's outrageous or um, um, extraordinary that you have to do. Okay, so we're going to build relationships. We're going to keep our environment calm and safe. We're going to have a social emotional curriculum and this is um, very big now in uh, both education and early childhood education. Do you have social emotional learning as one of the foundations of your program? And then we need to have plans for um, any crisis moments. Okay, 
Um, Stanley Greenspan was a child psychiatrist. He talked a lot about children with um, uh, early challenges. And I, I think this quote is really important. Building a relationship with a child is not always easy, but the situation that develops if you don't isn't going to be easy either. So we need to reach out and we need to make a commitment to any child that you find difficult and say, well, I'm going to connect with that child. When? In playtimes. Be on the floor with them. Engage with them. Uh, try, to, um, try to let them know that you're meeting them halfway. It's as if we're making a deposit in a child's relationship piggy bank when we do this. And I want to, uh, <clears throat> to just tell you about a couple of children just to give you a little bit of a sense of what this is like. Um, there was a, um, a little girl who came from a very difficult situation. She had just been taken from her home and put into foster care. And she was in the, the senior preschool room at a child care I used to visit. And uh, when I went in one morning, she was sitting on the, uh, the uh, RECE's lap. And they were just kind of cuddling and checking together. And then the um, ECE said, well, are you ready to go and play now? And the little girl said, will you play with me? And the ECE said, yes, I will. And she said, OK, then I'll play. And she said, what do you want to play? And she said, I want to play baby. I want to be your baby and they want you to take care of me. Now, the, the beauty of doing um, your, your connecting during playtime is that you can do that. You can, and this little girl went and pulled uh, some of the baby clothes out of the doll play center and brought them over, and uh, the RECE put a little teeny tiny hat on her head and tried to just make that um, deposit into her relationship piggy bank. Okay, stay close by. Um, this is a huge part um, for children who, uh, um, if you want to, to prevent um, some of those uh, challenging behaviors. Again, another very quick little story. Um, one of my uh, ECE students um, in a class, we were talking about supporting children that needed a little bit of extra. And uh, she said she had a little guy who was, his challenges came when he was playing and very quickly the play would fall apart and, and he'd be hitting and then he'd be pulled out of play. And the, um, the uh, st student said, I remember being like that as a child and I really feel for him. So she just made a commitment that she would stay close by and when things were falling apart, she would catch it before he got too upset and say, you know, do you want some help to resolve this, or do you want to come with me and we'll spend some time doing something else? And it was not that you have to leave because you've messed up here. It was a, a very caring and supportive option for the child. Okay. I don't think I need to say too much about this, but make sure that your environment does have the cozy corners, the uh, comfort zones, the places for a child to be alone and whatever self-soothing alternatives the child needs. Um, many kids, they can be anything, and you'll be surprised if you start having this, these conversations with kids what they find soothing. Conversations with children, I call them caring dialogues because they're not one-way conversations. They're really paying attention and listening to the messages that children are giving. An awful lot of them are pre and nonverbal. Their facial expressions, their body postures, they're showing us that they're not in a state of well-being. And then some of them send those messages um, in a very powerful and aggressive way when they feel trapped or threatened or overwhelmed by their emotions. And no matter which of those situations, we have to try and hear the message the child is sending. And we have to let them know that it matters to us. And then another goal that we're trying to meet is by facilitating um, the child's understanding of those emotions, helping them to get to a place where some of their communications may be more verbal 
and less behavioral and um, helping them to understand that think, feel, act link. That you wanted the toy, you thought it was yours, you got upset when someone else took it, and then you got angry, and then you acted. And the child can learn that there's one or two or three or four different ways to act. We need, again, I think there's a little bit of a repeat, but to make sure that we're teaching this, not just in, in uh, problem-solving situations, not just when they come up in, uh, in uh, challenging situations, but in, in our group times, um, we need to be modeling and using emotional vocabulary, talking about the four main emotions, happy, sad, mad, and upset worried, scared. We need to understand that the child has the right to feel the emotion that they feel and accept it and not try to say, no, they don't hate you or no, that you don't need to be worried about that. The child is worried. They do feel rejected. We need to, to offer concern for that. I'm really sorry. Here, let's talk about that. Come sit with me. And there are just amazing books out there now, more and more. I remember 10 years ago teaching this, and you couldn't find good books on social-emotional learning. But now everybody's getting into the act. Photographs, um, magazines. I cut a lot of my photographs out of um, parent magazines. OK. And then our 911 call. So the child is having a crisis. They feel that they're threatened. And I had a little guy like this in a kindergarten. He would get angry, frustrated with the other kids, and he would explode. You know, hit people, try to throw furniture, tip tables over. Um, his behavior was very clearly a 911 call. And whether we thought that there was a danger or a threat in the room didn't matter. Um, so I was uh, leading the, uh, the teachers in that room, the uh, ECEs, and I said, okay, we need a plan here. We need a really clear plan. And <clears throat> with, that, uh, with that plan, then we all felt much, much calmer and, uh, and more ready to deal. So that child was feeling flooded. He was feeling upset, unsafe. He didn't want to feel that way. And he appreciated the support that he had to not feel that way. So um, I can tell you one instance where um, he was some, they had actually, two of them had kind of moved him out into the hall so that he wouldn't hurt anybody else. And, and there was another teacher that was kind of um, standing guard. And I got to him and I went right up to him really close and I squatted down and the other teacher said, no, no, don't get that close. He's going to hurt you. He said, no, he's not going to hurt me. Watch. And I said, okay, hey, buddy, I'm here. I'm here. Whoa, calm. I, you're safe, and I need to help you out with this problem. And that's what our relationship CPR is. Calm language. Singing, humming, breathing together with the child. Slowing his heart rate down and his getting his breathing down to yours. So that's what, why it's so important that you are calm, because the child's um, uh, reaction to stress is going to stay high if you are also stressed. But the closeness, the slowness, the quietness will slowly calm them down. And then a really clear um, message of protection. You're OK. You're safe. No one's going to hurt you. Um, we're going to figure this out. Do you want me to hold you? Do you want to sit on my lap? Um, and you always ask before touching because that can be a trigger. And then do you want to be alone? There's a safe place that you can go that no one will bother you. And that protection is so valuable to the child because it allows them to regain their sense of calm. And then respect. I get how upset you are. I get how angry you are. Um, and I'm just uh, I'm hoping that there's time to tell you one more quick story. Um, 
So um, I'm going to fit this around how you would start this, uh, um, this relationship building with a child. And uh, it's about um, a, one of our ECE graduates that we ran into when we were doing our Kids Have Stress 2 training. And uh, she was in a JKSK class as the designated ECE. And um, she had a very challenging little girl in that program who had just uh, come into the JK class from um, um, a move out of her biological family and into foster care. And she was in uh, toxic stress. And I just want to uh, tell you that the year that we saw them had been a, a year, a full year later. And she said, the, uh, the uh, ECE said, I'm so glad that I learned what I learned in college because this little girl, I wouldn't have known what to do with otherwise. And she said, I just spent all of my time last year just working on our relationship and we spent so much time you know, when she would fall apart, I would take her hand, we would walk outside, we would walk up and down the hallway. Um, she said it didn't wasn't easy. You know, there were a lot of times in the beginning where I just had to stand there while she thrashed around on the floor and kicked and the other, um, the kindergarten teacher would get the other children back so that no one was in danger. And so she said this was a year later and she said, we are doing so well now. She is doing so well. And uh, she said, this is what happened today. Um, she had a, she said, I do give her stickers. And she said, I know that stickers aren't always necessary for a lot of kids, but for her, she needs that visual um, uh, evidence that she's done well. So she talked about, um, um, She had a, a total meltdown and she laid on the floor and she kicked and she screamed. And uh, when she was finished, um, the uh, ECE gave her her 15, her, her four stickers um, anyway. And she said, why did you give me four stickers? Didn't you remember that I kicked and I screamed? And the ECE said to her, yeah, you had um, some really strong emotions and you handled them really well. You didn't hurt anybody, you didn't break anything. You didn't scream at anyone. You just cried until you were calm. And that's a four sticker day. And I'm looking at the time and realizing I've given you no time for questions. I'm so sorry, um, but I am not going anywhere. So if you have questions, more than happy to, uh, to hang around. And I really want you to think about um, finding ways to build those relationships with children that will prevent the challenging behaviors. And that was a lot to squeeze into a very short Thank session. Thank you, Jan. This is uh, Melinda. That was really a fabulous uh, webinar. And thank you so much for providing um, so many really great stories and examples from the sector to really bring this topic uh, to life. Um, so I see there is a question or two. So if we do have a moment, um, one of the questions is really about language. So what about language barriers? So the question being, how could you support a child uh, who maybe doesn't understand uh, your language? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important question. And I'm just going to say, you almost go back in your way of thinking to the way you are with, uh, with uh, an infant or a toddler. And you keep your language very simple and you learn the keywords that the child needs and there's sort of like a a little set of keywords that a child needs they need to be able to say to say i want i don't want um please help my turn some of those really important things and then you need to have the same kind of of um, very clear messages back to them. I will help. I'm here. Um, what do you need? And just really keep um, the conversation very simple. Um, and also use use photographs. I can't uh, believe how successful one of the uh, toddler teachers in a center I was um, visiting was with putting the, um, the flow of the day on the wall. 
and a little guy who had very little language was going up and pointing to the pictures and um, just trying to, uh, to point to the pictures and, and say single words, lunch, lunch, lunch. And I think that um, we, adults have a little bit more problem with communication than children do when there's a, a language difference because we like to, to use words to communicate. Um, but um, deciding that you're going to be nonverbal in your communication um, can be really, really helpful. Um, I had a little girl once, um, she didn't talk at all. And we had to watch her behavior just so closely. And I, I'm going to tell you another really fast story because it's beautiful. She was trying to connect with the teacher but without words. And she watched how the teacher had tied a little boy's shoe. And she went close to where the, uh, and when I say teacher, I mean ECE. When she went close to where the ECE was and untied her shoe and then just stood there waiting. And luckily there was someone who was observing that was able to say to the ECE, you need to get over there and tie her shoe because she's sending you a message. So um, part of it is, is um, getting picture books, getting, you know, um, uh, photographs and symbols and things. And there's um, a really good website called Connectability. Um, they're out of Toronto and uh, they have some really nice uh, um, resources on, on uh, communicating with children who don't have the language. And I'm looking at the second question and thinking, um, so children who are trying to talk, um, a lot of it is being, again, nonverbal. Do you want something? Okay. Can you show me what you want? Um, do you need something? Do you want to go somewhere? And um, and again, having pictures that they can point to, um, the more complex their needs are, the harder and more frustrating it is for the child. So we really want to um, to figure out ways to, ha to help them and support them to communicate. Okay, great, Jan. Um, that was that was fabulous. We could certainly go on all night with with regard to this uh, topic. Uh, <laughs> before we leave tonight, I did want to take a final audience poll. Uh, so the question is: From what you've learned, it reflects the question from earlier. From what you've learned tonight, do you think that caring and responsive relationships with children and families help you to anticipate and prevent challenges? <laughs> yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It uh, can't do this work without those relationships. And um, it, it's interesting to me, I'll just say this as people are kind of winding up. Um, my little granddaughter as, uh, is very young. She's 18 months and she's been going to childcare. And um, when she moved from the infant room to the toddler room, um, the toddler teachers uh, said, she doesn't like us. <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, she hasn't had a chance to learn to like you yet. She's only transitioned up a week ago. And I think that we just, we really need to, uh, to recognize that relationship building isn't fast. Sometimes it takes a week, sometimes it takes a month. And the one little girl I was telling you about, you know, it took her over a year to be able to trust and build that relationship. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you, Jan. I'd like to say on behalf of the College of ECE, uh, we really want to thank you uh, for, for coming out tonight. And all of you at home, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we do want to let you know that all three webinars for the Standards Matter series will be available on the YouTube channel. Uh, so please do check us out and subscribe. Um, and also just a reminder to really consider getting involved in the college. Uh, it's really the one, one big way you can keep our profession moving forward. It helps you stay current uh, and advance your leadership skills. And running for a seat on council is a way to have your voice heard. Um, 
and member participation in, in our council and committees really do benefit you uh, in meeting other members and uh, community leaders. Um, would also uh, encourage you to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and, and check us out again on our YouTube channel. Um, and thank you again for, for joining tonight. I visit our website regularly and I uh, appreciate uh, all of you coming out uh, this evening. And again, thank you for the, the, the privilege and the opportunity. I, uh, I really enjoy talking about these kinds of issues. Okay. Good night, all. Good night.